Uh, let's roll right into our post-race winning team for today's 44th annual Quicken Loans 400, and our race winner is Dale Earnhardt, Jr. He drove the number 88 Diet Mountain Dew, the Dark Knight Rises National Guard Chevrolet for Hendrick Motorsports. He's joined up on the podium by his crew chief, Steve Letart. And, uh, Dale, this is your 19th win in NASCAR Sprint Cup. Uh, second time you won here at uh, Michigan on Father's Day. I know uh, that uh, coming out of yesterday's practice, uh, might not have had the uh, best feeling in the world, but I tell you what, you came out here today and you showed that you're a contender for this championship in 2012. Talk about the win here today at Michigan. Yeah, we had uh, – <clears throat> We had some, uh, you know, tough things to come overcome this weekend with the with the tire issues, and they made some changes, and we weren't really – I wasn't very confident after the practice last night. Steve felt pretty good, uh, talked about how we would we – would, you know, we would – the things we would do to the car, and he felt, he felt pretty confident, and uh, I was a little nervous. When the race started, uh, the car wasn't quite where I needed it to be. We weren't in, in, in too big a trouble, but – we needed some adjustments and and in that moment you know it's really kind of tough to to give steve or i guess i worry whether he knows exactly where i'm at or what what i need with the car how much i need you know but i guess he knows me well enough because he made the right calls and that thing took off to flying and then he made some you know pit strategy uh choices that put us toward the front to where the car could respond and if we had a fast car, it was going to happen, and it did. So he did a good job, and, and from there on, we just did everything we had to to keep ourselves in the top, you know, five or the top three to stay in the clean air because it looked it was def definitely difficult in traffic, especially in, in, you know, from 10th on back. It was really a real challenge to run around there. So uh, he did a great job uh, putting the car toward the front, and the car responded when we got there. And I just, I just learned a lot, you know, running around behind people and learned about what my car was capable of doing and pushed my car a little bit harder each time we ran around the corner and found where the car was comfortable and fast and just, just tried to maintain a good pace. I was worried about tire issues and stuff like that even late in the race because our car kind of started turning better and I was thinking, well, you know, I'm going to work the right rear a little harder. So I just sort of saved a little bit in my pocket the last 50 laps and uh, run only as hard as I thought I needed to. And at the end of the race, man, that thing was a rocket. I couldn't slow it down. It was so fast. Steve Latar, congratulations on this win here today. And maybe just talk about, you know, we started testing here on Thursday. And we tested win, uh, Friday. Then we had a tire change Saturday. And uh, just talk about working through all that, navigating through all that. And uh, now here you are in victory lane. Yeah, I mean, it's um, it's been an eventful weekend. I think it really started back in Pocono. We had some concepts and some ideas in the race car we took there, and it showed speed, so we were excited to get here. And um, we were pretty comfortable with our car on Thursday, and on Friday we were you know, disappointed to see the tire trouble because we felt we had pretty good speed, but we understood the situation, understood what needed to be done. And uh, when Goodyear brought the different tire in that short happy hour session, um, we did the best we could throwing some things at the car to get feedback on it. And I can't say enough about our guys. Uh, you know, it was a long day yesterday, and uh, they left with as much energy as they came in with, and they were ready to go, ready to go to work this morning. And uh, the engineers put just a tremendous car together with some uh, great ideas, and Hendrick engines stuck together. You know, we went over our laps for sure in practice, and uh, to be able to run 200 strong laps today, it was really a total team effort, and it was, um, it was good. We had to make adjustments on our car today. We made them early, and then we worked really hard on our, tr on our pit strategy, and... Um, just kind of all worked out. It was it was great. Thank you very much. Let's start upstairs in the press box. We'll start upstairs. We got three questions up there, and then we'll come back down here. Go ahead, press box questions for Dale or Steve. Monty Dutton, guessing is it. Dale, of the things that changed, this race was run at a much. The laps were at a, probably a slower pace than they would have because of the change in the tires, but the hardness of the tires probably made things a little treacherous in the turns. What do you think? Did those two factors balance each other out? Would, did slowing the cars down help, or did the changes help or hurt? I know they helped you, but I mean just for the, for the, for, for the difficulty of driving a race car. The car was a, a real handful. Um, 
especially being around other cars, uh, you don't, you know, when they change the tire, it takes away a ton of mechanical grip. So the car really relies a lot on the aero grip from that point on. And when you get around other people, you lose that. So when you have no mechanical and no aero, the car's a real, real tricky thing to get through the corner. You got to be careful because wherever cars are around you, that, that changes how the air is displaced from your car. So you just got to know where, if a guy's on your right rear quarter panel, how that's going to change the aerodynamics on your car versus a guy being on the front of your car or out on the, you know, on the left side or whatever. So you just kind of got to know that going in the corner and watch out. But, uh, you know, I was really disappointed that we, not really that they changed the tire. I was just disappointed we were going through the process. I know everybody was. I know NASCAR was, and Goodyear was probably disappointed. But we had worked, you know, for, for a couple of days pretty hard at getting the thing to work with what we brought here. And then we were making a change, and we were sort of, you know, we were we were kind of thrown into a deal where we had, you know, an hour to figure it out. But we only had 25 laps on our motor. Our guys, our motor tuner wouldn't let us run more than that, even if we weren't. I told Steve, I said, what if we're going to go into this last practice with 25 laps, and what if my car's junk? And we, we he says, we can't practice no more. I mean, that's how strict of a deal it is. So I was des I was desperate in that last practice to to get – something to work and and when when it ended i still wasn't really sure if we were where we needed to be and i was woke up this morning just antsy not knowing how we we're how this was going to play out we'd had we'd done so well up to this point um cognizant of the top tens and the and the and the laps we've ran and how steady we've been all year and i just want to keep that going each weekend and i felt like that we might be getting you know getting ready to have a difficult race it turned out to be the exact opposite for whatever reason but it was i was just disappointed we were kind of going through that process and i know that at the time i didn't know if it was the right decision or not it, it we got to put on a race today without any problems without any tire problems so i assume that you know everything's okay and everybody you know we'll, we'll probably have to tire test here again and figure out something a little bit better than this but uh because this definitely ain't the answer but you know, we got through the weekend okay, and we didn't have any trouble with guys blistering tires because we're going pretty fast out there with this new surface to have tires blistering and coming apart. I, that would have I would have hated to see anything, uh, you know, happen to anybody or even myself with with a tire failure or something like that at that speed. Stay upstairs, press box. Go ahead. Uh, Nate Ryan, USA Today. Uh, Dale, kind of a two-part thing. Uh, Matt Kenseth said after the race that he considers your team probably like the premier threat right now to win the championship and i know that you got a lot of congratulations on the way uh to, to victory lane from other drivers i know jeff gordon and i think jimmy johnson both came in congratulate what, what's it mean i guess to have that to have one people happy for you that your, your peers are, are happy that you, you ended that drought but two they're also talking about you as a as a title contender well i guess it means i'm an all right dude um <laughs> when people are happy for you see you know want to see you do good that's the way I feel about people when I, w I want to see good people do good things, you know, and I want to see people that I think are, you know, good people have success and be happy. So, you know, I, I, uh, I feel like we're, uh, you know, I feel like we're getting stronger. One of the things that we did last year throughout the season was kind of maintain. And I was a little, even, even though I was happy as hell to be with Steve and be, be able to run well and be competitive, I was a little disheartened that I didn't progress through the year, really. I didn't find more speed as the year went on. We just kind of stayed the same throughout the season. And maybe Steve looks at it a little different than I do. We don't talk about that much. But this year, we've gotten faster throughout the year. We started off pretty quick, and we've gotten quicker and quicker, especially these last couple of weeks. So that's been a thrill for me. Um, I don't know really where we stand in the in the uh, in the in the competition level or what what have you where we are as far as being a threat to win a title. I think that's a great compliment from Matt. But um, we just want to, you know, we kind of stayed. We just kind of kept our nose to the grindstone to try to win a race. We'll just try to try to keep doing that to try to win the next race and see what happens. Stay upstairs, press press box. Go ahead, please. Uh, Rachel Lindsay from the Toledo Blade. Looking back four years ago, what was that like to win four years ago to the day? 
What do you remember from that day? And is it the same feeling as you have today? Well, unfortunately, it was. I was so nervous in the last few laps of that race four years ago, and this and today, this was the worst. That was the worst feeling riding around there with 15 laps to go, wondering what was going to happen, or how you were going to lose. <laughs> so uh, I was just thinking, man, what you know? I, those laps couldn't go by fast enough. I ran. I was like, you know, I got a big lead. I'm taking it. I'm going to take it easy. No, I'm going to run hard, get it over with. You know, so I was in there just going crazy, thinking, you know, and I, I'm looking all around the racetrack for, you know, hoping there's no debris around the next corner. Yeah, I just knew I was going to come around the next corner and see a piece of metal laying in the racetrack. I just was waiting on something to happen, you know, so uh, that was ter terrifying, to be honest with you. And I was kept thinking about Steve and the team and how hard we've worked and how we deserve to win and how we should win. Uh, and was hoping it would happen for everybody. You know, that that was, uh, you know, but that race four years ago was a fuel mileage race, and today we just whooped them really good. So it felt, that felt good. Let's come downstairs. Questions for Dale. Let's go with Lee, Bob, and Joe. Lee Spencer, Fox Sports. Not to take anything away from your win, but what does the guy next to you mean to you? I mean, it just seems since the two of you, and, and I know you know you guys are both really humble, but it, the turnaround that, that since the two of you have gotten together, it's just really clicked. It has. Um, we've we've been doing some great things. Uh, he's hard to compliment because he doesn't take it very well. Um, but him and that team, they can have all the credit. They they. My engineers and Steve sit in that lounge every weekend and make the car go. You know, they make it turn. They make it whatever I want it to do. If I ask them, you know, if I'm this is my problem and this is where we're hurting, they get together and they fix it. And uh, he during the race, just like today, you know, every week we start the race and, uh, all right, we're going to have a few issues. These are the issues. And Steve fixes them. He gets with his, with his engineers and they make it better. And, uh, that's amazing to me. Uh, him and that whole team, you know, deserve, especially today, that car, you know, and it wouldn't matter who was driving it today, that car was going to be the fastest thing out there and going to win the race. So that car, you know, deserves all the credit. And so the guys that put it together deserve all the credit. And, you know, Steve's just really sharp. He called a great race. I trust in him to, to do that every week, and I know he will. Um, you know, I just trust that he'll, he's going to, you know, he's looking out for the, not for the best interest of just me. He looks out for the entire team and puts great people around himself to be able to do the job right. We have a good group. This today really solidifies and justifies our, our efforts, and, and we can move forward to try to do more, do more good things. So I think this is really great for everybody. But uh, Steve and, you know, he, when you go to the shop and – and watch him kind of work and you know you can see you can see where this team you can see how this team is as good as it is by just being in the shop and watching him sort of dictate and move pieces around on like on a chessboard i mean he's he's really sharp let's go with bob uh, joe menzer and then david go ahead bob uh, bob hocker sporting news uh, steve was there ever can you talk about what maybe what point you knew that you had a driver who still kind of had the passion and still could win races um, since you started working with him? <laughs> I probably unloaded a new Severna probably uh, last two, a year ago, February. I mean, never in a, a moment or a day did I ever question his desire to drive. Um, we sat down kind of when the whole deal came together. We spent some time that off season. You know, uh, we went to Vegas for the banquet and a couple other things. And <clears throat> you know, I kind of laid out what I thought would be a good plan to, to approach the season, no different than I would any of the other years and uh and he was completely on board gave his opinion on it, things which are great you know anytime you can get an opinion of a veteran driver a guy that's won that many races it only makes your team stronger and uh we went to new Smyrna to do nothing but make laps and from that day forward we've been uh you know all steam ahead i've one thing i can say you know we've had bad runs good runs uh disagreements agreements but i can say from the day we started working together i don't think it, I hope he's never questioned my desire to improve the team and to run well. And uh, I'd never have questioned his desire and, and where he stands as far as the team and what our goals are when we come in here. And uh, 
you know, that's hard. It's a long season. I mean, there are weeks you, you know, you are cranky to come to the racetrack. There are weeks they change the tire on you after you've worked two days and, you know, you, what else possibly could happen. And, uh, I can say, you know, it's not always been peaches and cream. I mean, we have had disagreements. That's great. That's healthy disagreements. But I can say, really, the devotion and the desire was never, never questioned by me at all. Let's go with Joe and then David Newton. Go ahead, Joe. Joe Manzer, NASCAR.com. Uh, Dale, I, I'm guessing you think this is pretty cool now, uh, as opposed to the comment you made the last night. But uh, did you guys both talk a little bit about uh, – you know, what this meant in terms of the way you won, uh, kind of validating, uh, you know, your season and what it also means in terms of, uh, you know, the chase and everything else. Because uh, obviously if you had gone on to, into the chase with no wins, you would have been behind some yeah. people. Yeah, that, there's a lot of things. We're in the all-star race next year, uh, so we don't have to grind it out in, that, in, the, uh, in the shootout. Um, we're back on the Winter Circle program, which is a big deal to the company. As, a, as far as income and, and revenue. Uh, so over the last two and a half, three, four years, we've missed out on a lot of that revenue. Um, so that's great. Um, and we're, uh, you know, I've never had bonus points for the chase. <laughs> so that's kind of, that's neat. So, um, you know, I feel like, uh, you know, we're, we we'll want we want to win some more races before the chase starts, obviously, and 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 you know we'll think about where we are points wise when that all happens after Richmond. But uh, you know we kind of have to. I don't want to get too far ahead of myself. We got to go to the ne we got to go to Sonoma next week and figure out how to get around there and get my first top ten at that place. Um, we uh, you know we got a lot to accomplish this year, but it, it's it's. It's an it's a good good deal for the team. It, uh, it feels good to win in that shop. I got moved into that shop a year and a half ago, and and that shop's got all them trophies and got all of them wins with Jimmy and Jeff, and they're they're used to success. So it feels good to be able to bring those guys what they deserve. All the employees will get uh, bonuses or what have you from this win. So the whole company sort of gets to enjoy the effect of this so it's a it's a great deal we got this victory bell that will that i get to take around for the first time <laughs> since right. we built it and ring the hell out of it all <laughs> over the all over the complex i'm gonna ring that damn thing as hard as i can <laughs> <laughs> so it's it's a big deal uh for for me but i, I like seeing you know uh, i like seeing the smiles on everyone else Everyone, everybody else's face. I'm, I'm gonna enjoy this, and, and and I am enjoying this. But it's so awesome to see how many other people it, it affects, and how it, how many people are are affected by it. you know that kind of just what happened today. Question right here. My comment as well. No. I yeah, guess the only thing Steve. is the only difference. I guess the only thing I would say is what today does is solidifies decisions like last week, makes them a lot easier one way or the other. Uh, you know, it was disappointing last week because we hadn't won in three years. If we had won three weeks ago, nobody would have cared that we pitted. You know, you had a great car, you pitted, ah, well, really ran eighth, you'll get him next week. And, uh, you know, we had confidence in one another to make that decision because we knew the goal. We we had discussed the goal. We know what the goal was. The goal was to get as many points as we could to get out of there. And that's every week or, is to run the best we possibly can. And um, now that this has this proved to us, you know, you you – you see race teams, and I've been a part of them, that you you don't race out of desperation, but you start swinging for the fences. You know, when you're down seven or eight runs in the ninth inning, I mean, bunts aren't going to work. I mean, you got to start by putting guys on base. And this proves to us that our strategy is correct. If you bring fast enough race cars, you don't have to get outside your comfort zone too far. I don't think you have to get super crazy with the pit strategy. You just need to put in uh, – we say it all the time. You just need to put in hard work, hard work every Sunday. And, and this kind of helps us understand that we aren't crazy that our goals are and what we've been trying to do has been working. Go ahead, David, and then uh, Stan, and we'll go back upstairs. Go ahead, David. Jim. Yeah, David Newton, David Newton ESPN.com. Dale, um, two questions. First, uh, Rick, I guess, talked to you on the phone there. What did he say? And secondly, uh, Tony Stewart said it's not a national holiday. Um, do you feel like it is? I do. For me, it is. Um, I'm sure it's running second for me wouldn't be a holiday either, but uh, – you know, it um, it sure feels it's a it, it it feels good to win and and I'll enjoy it and and 
in a day or two I'll be thirsty for the next one. But uh, Rick, I told him he should have a good excuse for not being there. <laughs> he better be on a boat somewhere in the Keys or something. <laughs> but he said he was at home and they were but they were thrilled to death. And uh, you know, so I, I know that you know, no matter where he was, he enjoyed this. And uh, he's, I told him that. Uh, I had to thank him for sticking with me and getting me back to Victor Lane, that he went through hell and high water to make it happen, and he should enjoy uh, enjoy the win. Stan. Stan Creekmore, rpmtonight.com. Junior, it's very, it is a very special day today, obviously, and you're winning everything, but did, did at any point in time you take a minute to think about your dad as, as the laps wound down or as the checkered flag flew? Uh, no, sir. Um, as much as that would good, be a good story, I hadn't even really thought much about it being even being Father's Day, and I had missed out on a lot of opportunities to wish everybody a happy Father's Day. Um, it just uh, had slipped my mind, pretty you know, pretty much. Uh, but it is uh, it is Father's Day, you know, so I'm happy for for that fact uh, due to the circumstances, and it means makes it mean a little bit more uh, to have won on Father's Day and uh you know get the opportunity to just come here and sit down and wish everybody a happy father's day after all my after it slipping my mind all day long and missing it through all the other interviews i've had today go upstairs press box questions uh nate ryan again uh, dale you were saying that uh, in a day or two you'll be thirsty for more H how late will you let the party go at whiskey river tonight and uh, th does the guy <laughs> next to you kind of like maybe – I know you talked a lot about how Steve's changed your mindset. Does that – is it kind of like you, you do this, you celebrate for one day, you, you party late in the night, and then it's – on Monday it's over? Well, you know – Not one day, I can assure you. <laughs> <laughs> I'll just – I'll probably – I'll probably uh, – I probably won't lead, lead by example, but I'll probably just kind of see what – what what everybody else does and just kind of jump in the pool if it looks if the water's warm but um <laughs> i just uh you know i don't i don't want to get carried away we 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 got a great thing going we want to be sharp and i want to be sharp when i go to the next race we got a tough one at sonoma and we got like a chip on our shoulder to go there and run well because of the struggles i've had at that place we will enjoy this and and i cannot wait to go home and see my family and my friends i know that they're dying for me to get there so we'll have some fun tonight and uh you know if steve will probably get home a little too late for this evening but it's whatever we'll just kind of you know we got a couple of days off i got a i got a promotion to shoot with clean coal on wednesday so i need to get get my ship righted sometime around you know tuesday morning to be <laughs> sharp for them guys and uh that'll be that you know we'll we'll start thinking about and you know, we'll start immediately. Uh, we have a conference uh, to, you know, we have a conference meeting on Tuesday with all the drivers and crew chiefs, and that'll be a thrill since we won. But we've got to start talking about the next race, and uh, we need to keep our eye on the goal. And like I said, we'll enjoy this, but we're we're dead. We're we're ready for the next opportunity to to win one because this is fun. <laughs> I feel like we we were close, you know, so we, maybe we can get us a couple. Any other questions in the press box before we come back downstairs? We're good. Let's come back downstairs. Bob, did you have one? Bob and then Lee. Uh, Bob Parker, Sporting News. For both of you guys, are you more relieved or excited? Um, excited. You know, I think um, a little bit of both. Um, I think if it would have happened last year, it might have been relief because um, I don't – know if we had the speed last year I mean, we had some good runs at it we had some good cars but um you know we had some consistency but nothing like this year i think this year i'm a true believer in um statistics and i don't think it's luck i think you make your own luck and uh you know you get bad breaks along the way but if you have um, a strong enough race team and and strong enough cars then even the bad luck can't hold you down forever and i think this year we uh we have earned this win you know, I think it wouldn't feel as special if it would be our, you know, first year, 12 races in and, and not a top five in sight. But to go out and run like we did this year, I think at Las Vegas, we had a spectacular car, 
Dover, we had a good car, maybe not a winning car. Pocono, I feel we had a winning car. You know, when you start to have winning cars and then you finally win, it's excitement. I don't think it's relief. It's right. excitement because now you have winning cars and you know that the hard work is paying off. And that's why you're gonna, we're going to enjoy the win, but we're going to enjoy it to a point where, man, there's a lot of trophies left to get. And we want to get some more. Yeah. I say the same thing. I thought it would be all relief, but it was no relief at all. It was all excitement. Let's go to Lee. Go ahead, Lee, and then we'll finish with Jim Utter. Go ahead, Lee. Lee Spencer, Fox Sports. To kind of follow up on the excitement question, at what point did you feel the fans, I mean, they were all on their feet on the front stretch. I mean, at what point did you just feel them really getting into it? Well, I think um, I imagine they were into it. I come off a of Turn four for the checkered, and they were pretty excited all the way down the front straightaway. And uh, I felt good for them because they had – my fans had went through a lot to uh, stay dedicated, and they stayed loyal. And they asked – you know, they wondered – they wondered why we weren't competitive. You know, there were a couple, two or three years ago where we were far from competitive. I was as a driver. And uh, they wanted to know why we weren't competitive, and they wondered what was missing, but they never doubted me, and they never gave up. And so I know there's a lot of people that were happy today. Um, it, you know, it, I could tell. You know, I felt the, the, I felt the fan base. You know, I felt the, the excitement and emotion from them immediately, almost immediately. As soon as I got out of the car, I was that was. Um, my initial thoughts was about how many people were in their living rooms screaming at the top of their lungs and or running out in the yard or whatever they do, you know. <laughs> I uh, I just wish I could see it all at once. You know, that was the one thing that I kept thinking about. Final question. Go ahead, Jim. Uh, Jim Otter, Charlotte Observer. Uh, Dale, um, I believe out in Victory Lane on Sirius, uh, NASCAR President Mike Helton said, I think Dale Jr. declared today that he's the guy to beat this year for the championship. I know you already talked about contending, but what does it mean to hear that from him? You have a long relationship with Mike. Yeah, I'm, you know, Mike's Mike's an awesome dude. Um, you know, he, uh, there doesn't come any, you know, between him and Rick, there doesn't come any better when it comes to having it all together and just being a sharp person. But uh, so, I, you know, I, I trust his, I trust him all the time for guidance and advice and leadership um, because he's just so awesome at it. Um, so it means a lot coming from him to say that. I hope we can uh, prove him correct and we'll just keep working. Congratulations to Dale Earnhardt Jr., Steve Letarte, and the number 88 team. Big win here today at Michigan. And Rick. Enjoy it. One of the most talked about streaks in NASCAR history is over. After 143 races, Dale Jr. is a winner. Yeah, I double checked. It wasn't the 500. We really won it. <laughs> All right. Hey, good job, man. I know you guys have been waiting on that one. I know I have. Front row, Marcus Ambrose and Kevin Harvick. We are green at MIS. That's Kurt Busch spinning down the back straightaway. First caution of the day. He says the groove is starting to widen out a little bit. It was so narrow and edgy earlier on. 88, moving to the front. No prisoners the rest of the day. Zero. Oh, there's Joey Logano around. Hard into the wall in the back straightaway. Casey Kane, David Giveaway among those that got damaged. There is going to be a party in Junior Nation. Tonight. Three by winning, boy. Hell yeah. <laughs> the streak is over. Dale Earnhardt Jr. back to victory lane in Michigan.
Welcome everyone to NASCAR Victory Lane, driven by Good Sam Roadside Assistance. It was the most asked question in NASCAR history. When is Dale Jr. gonna win? Well, the answer is today. The streak is over at 143 races in Dale Jr.'s 450th start. Finally, Junior Nation is celebrating a win. And Kenny, this is huge for the sport. This is huge. Our CEO of NASCAR, Brian France, once said some four years ago, we need Dale Jr. to win to bring our popularity of our sport back. I hope that we see results of this huge historic win and it brings our sport back. Uh, you know, I mean, it's just monumental. It, it really is. I mean, everybody's been waiting and wondering when and where and how is it going to happen. But today, I just can't believe how it came about. The place where he won his last race, he comes back here to Michigan, and he won, wins it in convincing fashion. I mean, that car was bad fast here today. This racetrack has been bad fast today. We had a great race here, and this was not an easy win for Dale Jr. He had to beat Tony Stewart, our champion this year. I mean, pretty impressive. Well, of course, Dale Earnhardt Jr.'s win is the big story today, but heading into this race, the big story was the monumental speeds we had, some 215 miles an hour in the straightaways. Let's take a look at some of the highlights throughout the day on what was really a big unknown at the Michigan International Speedway. The first unknown was, were we going to race or not? After a two-hour rain delay, we finally got this beautiful new track drive, and it was time to go racing, and Jeff, we saw everything we asked for. Yeah, side by side, three wide, passing. Yeah, we really did, JR. And the thing is, the speed was there, but these guys treated it like they knew this racetrack like the old racetrack they really went at it it was very impressive some guys had problems early in the day Kurt Busch gets the 51 car out of shape right here gets into the side of David Gilliland but he was at least able to continue this was the first of his two spins. I think at this time they turned his radio off and said, stay quiet, Kurt. This is lap number 70. Here goes Dale Earnhardt Jr. past Marcus Ambrose, your pole sitter for the lead. And Jeff, he never looked back. He never looked back. And the, if you could have heard the crowd, it was like a little prelude to what we we're going to find at the end of the day. It was incredible right there because he just really stretched out on the field right there and flexed his muscles. The last time Dale Earnhardt Jr. led this many laps was the last time he won here. Look at last week's winner, Joey Logano. This wreck, Kenny, takes up Casey Kane as well. Joey Logano has to turn his car to get away from running into the back of the 38. When he does that, he loses it on his own. And look at this, two people that have one win and they're right on the verge of making the chase or not. Casey Kane, Joey Logano, both in a wreck. Very disappointing for them and a disappointing day for Joe Gibbs Racing as well. Yeah, they've had problems all three of these race cars. Denny Hammond spins around and something just literally catches on fire underneath this 11 car. He's able to get it back to pit road, but there for a little bit it was getting really scary. Scary moment for Denny Hamlin. Fortunately, he was okay after that, but no one was better than Dale Earnhardt Jr. in the number 88. Again, one of the longest winless streaks that people have talked about four years. There's Steve Letarte saying, we only got a few more laps to go. To me, this had to been a relief for him because he's been working so hard with this guy to see the 88 car finally take and win this, win this race. A great, I mean, this burnt off his, off his shoulders. And look at his crew, they're going crazy. Clearly, the weight of the racing world is off Dale Earnhardt Jr., and this is something we haven't seen, Kenny, in four years. With five laps to go, the whole place got eerily quiet. I believe Junior Nation was holding their breath, and here they are. They finally erupt. It was like, is it too good to be true? You couldn't have heard a pin drop in this place with five to go. And now you can't hear anything because Woo! the fans are screaming exactly so loud right. for Dale Jr. But here's the question. What happens next? Does this open up the floodgates for more wins for Jr.? Because they've been knocking on the door all season long. Why not? I mean, we've been talking about it. It was right around the corner, folks, and it finally happened. And it, it's not been by accident. This guy's been solid all year long. And we always say, if you get in position to win, soon you will win. Not only now has he won this race, but he's now put himself in a position to go after the, the title. I think it is just, you know, it's overwhelming what this has opened the doors for, not just the one win, but maybe a title chance. Yeah, and, and let's give examples. Remember, he has the race won last week in Pocono. Crew Chief Steve Letart makes a small mistake and says, I don't think we can make it on gas. Let's bring it down pit road. Then they have so many cautions, he would have, you know, most likely end up winning. But now on a fun stat, this victory brought out something we haven't seen on national TV, it brought out Dale Earnhardt Jr.'s girlfriend, and there she is. <laughs> the crowd is going wild, and they're saying, who is that lady? And everybody's finally getting a good look at her. Uh, easy now, Kenny. Easy now. <laughs> well, well. I'm a guy. <laughs> well, for more uh, news, let's go down to Wendy Venturini, who has an uh, update on the tire situation. Wendy? 
Actually, I'm in Victory Lane where you just saw on the backside Dale Earnhardt Jr. taking photos with his girlfriend. You can't wipe that smile off of Dale Earnhardt Jr.'s face. And for the fans that can't be here at Michigan Speedway, just to give you a little bit of look, almost every driver has come to Victory Lane. Mike Helton just left here to congratulate Dale Jr. in person. You can feel the emotion that's circulating right here in Victory Lane. There's so many fans, so much security, more than we've ever seen here for a Victory Lane celebration as they continue to take team photos right behind me. Now, on the flip side, there's an organization that did not have a great day, and that was Joe Gibbs Racing. Two of them didn't finish the race. One, and that being Kyle Busch, did finish, but absolutely had some problems. So those three cars took a little bit of a dip in the points. We will hear from them coming up on NASCAR Victory Lane. Bob Dillner. Wendy, I am talking tires because tires were the name of the game this weekend here in Michigan. A brand new pavement with new tires, no matter what Goodyear brought, did not mesh well. NASCAR worked hard, so did Goodyear and the racetrack. So who's to blame for all this fiasco? We'll let the drivers hash it out right here on NASCAR Victory Lane, JR. Bob, thanks a lot, you got that right. Coming up on NASCAR Victory Lane, driven by Good Sam Roadside Assistance. We're gonna get in to the tire issue, see exactly what happened on the right side and the left side, and we'll have the drivers weigh in on how that affected what went on on the racetrack. Joe Gibbs Racing did not have the kind of day they were looking for. In fact, one of their drivers ended up in flames on the pit road. Fortunately, Denny Hamlin was okay, but nobody better than Dale Earnhardt Jr. He celebrates the first win in four years. We'll talk to Jr., his owner, his crew, Chief and the rest of the group. NASCAR Victory Lane is driven by Good Sam Roadside Assistance. If it's not Good Sam, it's not good enough. Call or click now. Brought to you in part by Honda Generators, the power of choice. And by Lowe's. Lowe's never stop improving. Welcome back, everybody, to the Michigan International Speedway, where Dale Earnhardt Jr. is celebrating his first win in four years. 95 laps led today, and that's the most since 1998, which coincidentally was the last time that Dale Earnhardt Jr. won. And right now, we're going to bring in one of the happiest men in all of the NASCAR world. That is team owner Rick Hendrick. And Rick, first of all, we're sorry you couldn't be here to actually witness this thing. Logistics kept you away from it. But just how satisfying is this, and just how well is this season going for you guys? Well, man, you know, it was a slow, a little bit of a slow start, but we had a lot of speed, and then we get the 200th win, and then the all-star race, and Casey gets a win, Jimmy gets another one, and now I thought Dale had a real shot last weekend at Pocono, but to get the, this weekend, that's, man, it's outstanding. It's like a huge load off our backs. Rick, everybody had been looking at this team, and again, you never lost your focus and the confidence in this group as a whole. Steve Letarte, as well as Dale Earnhardt Jr. How, what kind of advice have you given these two? Because, I mean, again, they've been so solid. I'm sure you can see that win coming, but what will you tell them? Well, you know, they, they just get along so good. I think the chemistry is the best I've seen with any crew chief and driver. And you just look at the, look at the way they've been running and had a lot of speed. You knew it was going to come and just, you know, try to say, Dale, don't worry about that, man. You're almost in the lead in the points here. You got uh, more top tens than anybody. Just when you run second, third, and fourth, you're going to win races. And we hated Pocono not to take a chance, but just too much on the line. So I can tell you that's the longest 18 laps I've ever spent really? in this race. Rick, we're having fun with this victory. You know where you were at when you got married, what restaurant, what church. So on this day, where were you at exactly when you seen Junior cross the start finish line and win this race? <laughs> I was doing I was doing laps around my couch trying to <laughs> end this race, man. I was, it, bad man was in a hurry. I was too nervous <laughs> to stand still. <laughs> Linda and I were just watching it, saying, come on, no problems. I was so afraid there was going to be a caution something was going to happen. So, Rick, wins are so important this year on the way to a championship run, but right now this puts Dale Jr. so high up in the points with one win and also with the confidence as well. What do you think about championship potential for the number 88 team? Well, you know, when you see a car and a driver get momentum and all of the cars are running real well, they're sharing a lot of information, and Dale is just, he's just switched on. He's got, he's got the confidence in Stevie has got the touch and I mean that every week they're our best car and uh, I, I think he's sitting right in the catbird seat to win his first championship. 
Well, Rick, when you, when you, what will you guys do to celebrate this? I mean, is this something, I mean, you guys have had so many big wins, but this one right here, is this something that, that the organization will, you know, kind of like stop and just pause and say, hey, you know, this is a job well done? Well, well, we had Brad Paisley come down and play for our 200th win. No telling what we might do for this one. I don't know. <laughs> but that, we're going to have, we're going to do something. We, uh, we do like to celebrate together because the organization is, just work so hard and they want to see junior do so well and uh so stay tuned i mean they're talking about a ticker tape parade already in mooresville <laughs> a, national, a national holiday is what some people are talking about in junior nation yeah. rick thank you so much we appreciate your time congratulations man and, and keep up the good work this has been a great season for you guys <laughs> Thanks, guys. All right, that is team owner Rick Hendrick. Not only has he had the 200th win for the group, but also got Dale Jr. back into victory lane. Let's check into Twitterville. Here's what Elliot Sadler has to say. Congratulations, Dale Jr. So happy. Uh, now can you stop answering that nagging question every week when? Because the question has been answered. So Danica Patrick says, way to go, boss. Great to see Junior back in victory lane. Of course, Danica drives Dale Jr.'s Nationwide Series car, so he is the boss there. Rick Hendricks, the boss right now over top of this team that is back in victory lane. Now, in honor of number 88, Dale Earnhardt Jr., who just won the race in Michigan, Good Sam Roadside Assistance is discounting a limited number of memberships to their 24-hour roadside assistant plans to only $50. That's a 15% discount off the normal speed viewer rate of $59.95. Check out speed.com slash victory lane for more details when we come back we will talk to dale earnhardt jr to see exactly what his emotions are after winning after a four-year drought stay with us Welcome back, everybody, to the Irish Hills of Michigan, where the Irish eyes were smiling on the number 88 team. And as of today, all four Hendrick Motorsports teams have visited Victory Lane, but perhaps one of the biggest ones so far this year, as far as victories go, are Dale Earnhardt, is Dale Earnhardt Jr. snapping that four-year winless streak. Dale joins us now, and Dale, I know there's probably so many emotions going through your mind right now, but, but, but take away the numbers. How big is it for you to win just because you guys are interested in winning and want to win? <laughs> Well, it's a long time coming. Um, you know, I wanted to get back on the Winter Circle program because I knew I was costing Rick about a million dollars a year, <laughs> and uh, he would remind me of that every once in a while. Uh, but I got to thank, uh, you know, Rick and, and his whole organization for standing behind me when we weren't doing too well and believing that I could get back to Victory Lane, and they stuck with me. And, uh, you know, so I got to give them a lot of credit. I got to give my fans a lot of credit and uh, for, for the same reason, for – depending on us and, and relying on us to get back to where we needed to be. And uh, I got to thank my team, uh, Steve Letard and all the guys that he puts around me. Um, they're, they're the best in the garage, in my opinion, and, and it was a pleasure today to work with them. It's been a pleasure all year, but today was really special because uh, we whooped them pretty good. So uh, it felt pretty good. Dale, you did whoop them pretty good today. That car was very dominant. You did a great job of giving them the right kind of feedback, taking care of your car when you needed to. But, you know, you mentioned the year so solid so consistent but there were some times when the, it kind of slipped by your fingers you could maybe won a race like martin's well even like last weekend at pocono did those moments frustrate you at all no not really um to be honest with you i was so beaten up over the last couple of years um you know finishing so poorly every week and just trying to figure out why we weren't winning or why we weren't even running good and then uh, over the last year i've gotten close to victor lane that's a good feeling um, it, it, it is frustrating, you know, when on, on, at that very moment when you lose them really close. But it's a good feeling to know that you're close, know that you're on the, on the cusp of something great like today. Dale Jr., I've just talked to a lot of your fans, and they want to know something very seriously. When are you going to win again? <laughs> Next week, man. <laughs> <laughs> we, had, <laughs> we, we had to have fun with you. Everybody's all over wanting to know that. And we, we just, want, you know, congratulations. I think all of us are flabbergasted. In reality, though, no. Now, are you a different person right now? Can you, do you feel different right now? I don't know whether, uh, you know, I'm much different, but I knew I could get back to Victor Lane. I knew that I was with the right people, and I knew that it would happen if I could just, you know, we could just keep working hard. And, every, you know, everybody's got to buy in. Everybody has to kind of buy into the idea of what's happening there. And I knew it could happen. We just had to keep working. Um, there's a lot of confidence that, that I've been building back up, and it took a long time to do that. Um, confidence is half of the half of the battle out there on the racetrack. So it's been good to get get the confidence back and feel like you know now we can go 
uh, to racetracks in the future as winners and uh, as guys that we feel like you know we feel like we're a legitimate threat and uh, yeah it's a good feeling I don't I don't think I'm gonna be much different I'm gonna go home and celebrate the way I always usually used to and uh, hopefully we can win another one in the next couple of weeks and and keep it going hey Dale a lot of people thought it was unfair over the past uh, few years that people would say Dale Earnhardt Jr. must win for the sport to succeed. That was a lot of pressure <laughs> to put on one person's shoulders. Yeah. Did you feel that pressure, and did it ever get you down? No, I just felt like I deserved to, you know, had to win or, or should be winning for my fans. We had a lot of fans that devoted a lot to us and support us, really, uh, through a lot of tough times. And so I felt like I needed to win for them more than anybody. They, want, they were coming to the racetrack every week, waiting on it to happen asking the questions where where was what what pieces were missing what was keeping us from being competitive and uh but they stuck with us and uh so those are the people that, that i win for those are the people i feel like i need to win for real quick you know you made the pass on marcus ambrose our pole setter took the lead but late in the race you kept looking at rearview mirror and you kept seeing yeah. that 14 there and he just he just wouldn't go away he wouldn't <laughs> go away was, was he making you a little bit nervous well i was i was holding on the a little bit more in my race car than I was uh, showing there, but he was strong. I was trying to hold on to a little extra in case he was stronger than, than, than you know, who, who, it was a little bit cat and mouse there maybe. And uh, so I was kind of wondering if he was holding something in his pocket, so I was I was kind of doing the same. So I didn't I didn't work the right front off the car or, or get the right rear coming around too much to blister it up. And I just kind of kept the car straight in the corner and, and worked both ends of the car pretty much evenly. And I knew it would be tough to get by me. We're both really fast. It's going to be hard to pass at this place when you're running second. So um, I knew he had, had his work cut out for him. But hey, I thought he was going to come up there and steal one from me. And, uh, but we got going there to that last run, and, and, and he you know, got out of sight. Junior, the fans have chose me to ask you this question, and we have to beat People Magazine to it. Tell us about this. Never seen her. Yeah. Well, she doesn't want, want a whole lot of attention, but uh, we got a good. We get, we're doing pretty good. I'm glad she. I'm glad Amy was here to celebrate with me, and uh, it means a lot. She's a good girl, and uh, we've had a good relationship, and uh, she keeps me straight. So, I, uh, you know, I, I got a lot of good people around me right now, and I feel like that uh, the people that I do spend my time around make me a better person, and uh, definitely a lot better person than I was years ago. So, um, it's working out. Well, Junior, congratulations, man. Thanks for your time. Keep up the good work. And you know what? Now no one can ask you anymore. When are you going to win again? Yeah, let's <laughs> ask me, man. Hey, when are you going to win again? I just did. <laughs> yeah. When are you going to win again? We're going, we can get him in some old, maybe. <laughs> good deal, Dale Junior. Thanks a lot, man. We certainly you appreciate all. your time and keep up the good work there. Dale Junior is back in victory lane once again. Let's take a look at what the drivers are saying on Twitter right now. And Trevor Bain had this to say. Of course, he's a past Daytona 500 winner. Just like Dale Jr., he said, Junior. Isn't that the way you said that, Kenny? You got it, Junior! Junior. Congrats to those guys on never giving up. We had a good car today. Think the engine problems just took over too early, but congratulations once again to Dale Earnhardt Jr. Now, Casey Kane, one of his teammates, says, Great job, Dale Jr. Well deserved. And that is indeed true because this team kept hacking away and hacking away, and finally they got it. But Tuesday night, Hard Park South Bronx is all new. Joe has never backed down from a challenge, but this time the stakes are perfect. Personal. Can he go a day without eating and still keep his clients satisfied? Catch an all-new hard part in this all-new day and time, Tuesday at 9 p.m. Eastern time, only on speed. Well, some say he has the toughest job in all of NASCAR, but today he made it look pretty easy. Winning crew chief Steve Letard joins us next. Here's Harvick looking to the inside off turn four. He bumps the alert hard a little bit. Here comes Harvick to the bottom. When the 29 got there, I, I tried to be the bad guy today. Uh-oh. Uh-oh. He's slowing, isn't he? He is going to run out of gas. Dale Earnhardt Jr. will not win. Right out down the back straightaway, bud. 500 more feet. What do you do? 500 more feet. Here comes Jr. to the outside. Side by side with Kenza. He runs out of time. Dale Earnhardt Jr. getting it done here at Pocono. For a solid four and a half short. I ain't gonna forgive you for running me out of gas, so don't do that. Dale Earnhardt Jr. moves up one spot in the championship standing. We're getting kind of close, and it feels good to be competitive. We're one win race. <laughs> That's all I can tell you. We're one win, so bad we can't stand it. 
seven times, seven times during the winless streak. Dale Earnhardt Jr. finished second two times this year, and it has often been said that the most difficult job in NASCAR is to be Dale Earnhardt Jr.'s crew chief. Well, today Steve Letarte made that job look pretty easy. As Steve, you guys didn't only win this race; you guys had the field covered up. A dominant performance. How great does it feel not only to get this whole thing off your back, but also to have a day where you really covered everybody up? Well, it was great. You know, I can't say enough about everybody at Hendrick Motorsports. They gave us a great race car, and I'd be lying if I said it didn't feel great to watch those guys jump off the wall. They really deserved it. Steve, so we have all this drama last night with the tire issue. We're going to put a harder left side tire, and all of a sudden you dream this setup. Junior said last night, listen, I'm not done practicing. I want more practice. Tell me, what was his secret recipe? Well, it's uh, the secret recipe is having some really smart guys. You know, Kevin Mender and Dave Ellens are engineers. You know, we didn't leave here until probably 9 o'clock last night after practice, and, and they came in this morning with some great ideas. We put our heads together, changed stuff in the car. The guys in the car prepared it. I can't say enough about Hendrick Engines. You know, we ran way, way, way over our limit in practice, and uh, it held together for 200 laps, 200 flawless laps. I can't say enough about those guys. Steve, you had run second with this guy on a couple different occasions. Today, the final stop, when you were coming down to make that final stop, what was going through your head? Because I know you were thinking about, oh my gosh, please no mistakes. I will admit, once we left pit road the last time, it was a lot of pressure taken off our shoulders. About We were just waiting for the caution, about five laps before the green flag stopped to make it a few mileage race. But, you know, once it was available, we hit our window. The guys on the pit crew, man, they've been great all year long. And uh, they put together a flawless stop, got it full of gas, and then we were just uh, hoping it'd go green from there. Dale put a, a great final run together and pulled out to a pretty good lead. Now, Steve, of course, everybody's goal, especially at Hendrick Motorsports, when you start out the year, is to win a championship. How do you guys feel you're set up right now with the success you've had and the consistency to run for the big title? Well, I think we have as good a chance as anybody. I mean, we're, uh, whatever it is, 13, 14 races into the year. We're up there in the points. We've now won a race. Uh, those bonus points will help us in the chase. And be basically, you have to make the chase first. We know the summer's coming. We want to improve our, our summer last year. This is a great way to start. And, and we're just going to keep putting one foot in front of the other. Don't, uh, we didn't let the lows get to us. We're going to try not to let the highs get to us. Try to stay pretty mellow get real quick. and, uh, you know, do the best we can. Well, Steve, thanks a lot, man. Keep up the good work. Congratulations on a huge win. Thanks. I can't tell you how good it is to finally talk to you guys. <laughs> All right. Thank you. So All right. We're talking to you again very thanks. soon. That's crew chief Steve Letarte, the winning crew chief tonight. And also, we got to check in now with teammate Jimmy Johnson to see what he had to say by way of Twitter as he congratulates his teammate. So happy for Junior and the entire 88 team. Way to go for Steve Letarte and all of Team Hendrick. And actually, it is a very big team effort to get one of these victories done. Dale Jr. got it done today, and we'll have much more on NASCAR Victory Lane, driven by Good Sam, roadside assistance, when we come back. Next week, NASCAR Fast Friday takes on the twists and turns of Northern California. See NASCAR's best prepare to battle in the first road course race of the season. Live coverage from Sonoma begins Friday at 2.30 Eastern, only on Speed. Welcome back, everyone, to the Michigan International Speedway, where Dale Earnhardt Jr. is celebrating career win number 19, but this one's got to be number one in his heart right now because of his long absence from victory lane. Now, anytime you get a driver of this magnitude snapping a long windless streak, of course it has the whole garage area buzzing. So right now, for what the other drivers and the boss man had to say, let's go to Bob Dillner. Tony Stewart, so close here today at Michigan. Uh, Dale Earnhardt Jr. in victory lane. I, I know you're happy about that, but at the same time, what was the difference between you and him to here today? I'm not happy about that. I wanted to be there. So, uh, you know, it, just because it's the fourth anniversary of his last win doesn't mean it's all, all of us are supposed to lay over dead and help him. But uh, he didn't need help today. He was the fastest car and, and hands down the class of the field. He, uh, you know, he could just run the same pace the whole run. And, uh, you know, I was having, I was overdriving, trying to just stay with him. So there's no, we had no shot of keeping up with him. Internally, we have seen this momentum. We've seen the confidence between Stevie and, and Junior growing. Uh, the speed has been there at the track. They've been, you know, qualifying better, been winning practice sessions, running up front, leading laps. And we knew it was a matter of time, and they got it done today in big fashion. Uh, that's so awesome for him and those guys. I mean, I'm so proud of Stevie. You know, he's just, you know, such a great guy and works so hard. And Junior, you know, it's, 
unbelievable four years ago, you know, that it's been that long. So, uh, and they, you know what, they've been so solid this year. So that's what you got to do. You got to knock on the door and, and sometimes it opens up. The opportunities, uh, you know, have been there for those guys and they seized it certainly today. You had a great car and drove a great race. Yeah, cool to see Dale Jr. saying in victory lane. It's been, it's been a long time coming. They've been uh, the heat pretty much all year. I mean, they've been right up front knocking, knocking on the door. So it's nice to see him kick it down. One of the big days. Uh, it's uh... You know, it's it's like Tony doing what he did in Miami last year to to win the championship. It's it's not on par, I don't think, with and, and Dale would even say this if his dad went in the Daytona 500. But it's in that category. It's one of those big days, and uh, you know the 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 pressure that he's had on him to perform. Uh, I think at some point in time he just simply stepped up to it and delivered today. And that he did. Let's check in what his sister Kelly Earnhardt had to say. Finally, the thrill of victory. So excited for HMF, HMS, and our family, our friends, and Junior Nation. Let's celebrate. And also, teammate Jeff Gordon had this to say. Congrats to Junior number 88 team and everyone at Team Hendrick. Great victory today. Number 24 is next. Jeff Gordon wants to join the rest of his Hendrick teammates in victory lane so far this year. So the streak is finally broken for Dale Earnhardt Jr. It's his 19th Sprint Cup Series win and his 450th start. He's the 11th driver to win this season. And this is pretty cool. It's the second weekend in a row that a driver breaks a 100 race winless streak. But guys, let's go back to what Tony Stewart and also Jeff Gordon said. They said, okay, forget the streak. Forget who he is. He had the field covered up. He had a car that no one could beat. And, and I think that was very profound for Tony to say that. But Tony also said, look, I don't care who he is. Yeah, he I don't to like losing to him. Yeah, he beat me, but don't tell me I got to roll over and play dead because it's Dale and Art Jr. These guys in the garage area, if they take a win, if he takes a win from them, he's going to have to earn it. Look, the fans in the stands and everybody on TV and drivers in the garage area, it's a complete different world. In the garage area, they are sick and tired of hearing about Dale Jr. when he's going to win. So Tony Stewart was just classic right there. He said, look, I, I want to win. I don't care who the person is, it could be Jamie McMurray leading. So I get it and I totally understand and, it. And real quick right now, JR, when you think about it, Dale Earnhardt Jr., I think he likes repaints because he could have won that race. He, could have. he comes up here and he dominates. So these repays, repays are, I think, are right in his wheelhouse right now. And don't forget, we got to go back to Pocono. We got to come back up here. Yeah, and now we're also going to road course. Dale Jr. has been vocal over the years. He doesn't really like the road course, doesn't do very well there. But in order to win a championship, you have to do well on every type of racetrack. If Jr. goes there and runs well, that could speak volumes towards a championship run. I, I, I'll go out on the limb here, and I know you're going to like this one. <laughs> Dale Jr. Junior comes out leading the points next week because as, as great as Matt Kenseth is, I think Dale Jr.'s got an edge in road racing skills. What do you think of that? I think you're probably right because I'm going to be honest with you <laughs> folks, and I'm not knocking Matt Kenseth, but he, at road racing, he's terrible. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, that's what we're going to talk about when we come back to NASCAR Victory Lane, which is driven by Good Sam Roadside Assist. It's got to take a quick break. When we come back, we'll talk about the points. Right now, Matt Kenseth is on top, but he has some serious challengers for the points lead. Will he hold on to it? We've heard from Jeff. We'll hear more when we get back. Junior streaks up the back straightaway. Three car lengths in hand over Casey Kane. The crowd at Michigan going absolutely crazy. Junior to the lead. Dale Earnhardt Jr., his kingdom for a thimble full of fuel. The caution is out. The race is over. But remember, Junior has to maintain speed coming back around. I think they're getting ready to tear the grandstands down here in Michigan. Ah, way to go, Junior. We were close. We are going to stumble to the finish. Probably not win a race, but the caution saved us. Thing right, what they want, but we won one. <laughs> <laughs> That was four years ago, and it was a question of fuel mileage. But right now, the 143 race winless streak is over. And this time, Dale Jr. had him covered up once again. He led the most laps then. He led the most laps now. And there's no question he's a winner. He's the only one. Yeah, I double checked. It wasn't the 500. We really won it. <laughs> All right. Hey, good job, man. I know you guys have been waiting on that one. I know I have. As we begin the chase to the race to the chase, rather, after 15 of the 36 races, Matt Kenseth maintains the point lead over Dale Earnhardt Jr. by just four points right now. Greg Biffle still stays in third spot, but moved one point back uh, behind his teammate, Matt Kenseth. Then the top five are Johnson and Hamlin. Then it's Harvick, Martin Truex Jr., Tony Stork, 
Clint Boyer and Brad Keselowski in the top 10. Your wild cards right now, gentlemen, are Kyle Busch and Ryan Newman. But you know what? It's pretty crowded back there trying to break into that wild card spot. Uh, it's really edgy right there. I mean, JR, as we go through the famous final races right here, as we head into Richmond, I mean, this is where the big race is going to come from. Somebody is going to get on a hot streak. We know all of a sudden that, you know, Joey Logano looked like he was going to mount a charge. He had problems today. Casey Kane was kind of picking it up. He had problems today. All these drivers have one win. So the first guy to get the second one, he is pretty much going to put himself in the right position and basically put himself in that wild card. You know, there was a time a couple years ago when you looked at this format and you said, okay, one win could definitely get you in. Not this Anymore. year. We've got 11 different winners so far this year. So, Kenny, it is crowded. You're going to need two or three to guarantee you a wild card spot. Well, well I'm totally shocked that, that Kyle Busch is even in the, the realm, even in the pitcher. You fall out three weeks in a row, I mean, DNF did not finish. That's amazing he's even in there. But you go back to the stop of, top of the series. Usually I say, look, we're not worried about the points leader. Junior's leading now, so the world is a better place. But I must say this, how unique it is for, you know, Dale Jr. and Matt Kenseth because they are very good friends. You know, you say, does Junior have any friends? It's Matt Kenseth. Those two in the, in the uh, wintertime, you know, they had uh, parties all year long. We, we've seen them all over Twitter. So it, it's pretty incredible to see two great friends uh, at the top of the points. We've seen them? Yeah, right now. <laughs> On TV. <laughs> On TV, yeah, exactly. Well, you know what uh, What a difference a week makes for uh, Joey Logano. He won last week, and now look at the humbling wreck here uh, about mid-races. The uh, wild card hopefuls involved in here, Jeff. It is Joey Logano who has one win hoping for the wild card, and Casey Kane caught up as well. Yeah, the thing is right now, when you take a look at what happened here, on restart, all of a sudden the 30, it has a little bit of a problem. He gets loose. Next thing you know, he gets wrecked. Casey Kane gets wrecked, and it really puts everybody Everybody in, in a really bad position you know, at this point in the year. So when it comes to wins this year, that's why it's so important. You see Brad Kozlowski and Carl Edwards are 10th and 11th in, in points, but 12th and 13th, Kyle Busch and Ryan Newman, they have the wild cards right now, and they're the guys that are lurking in the background that can jump in, Joey Logano and Casey Kane, but not if they have the misfortune they had today. You know, Casey Kane set a, a personal record a month ago with like six or seven top tens in a row and he's never done that before and boom just like that last week and now this week Casey Kane's bad luck comes back wrong place at the wrong time and that happens a lot of luck has to play into this thing for you to be very successful let's go to Twitterville once again and see what some drivers had to say about their day not necessarily Dale Jr.'s uh, victory Martin Truex Jr. said we had an awesome car and uh, just couldn't catch a break Still a solid finish, and they keep rattling off solid finishes. Martin Truex Jr. is going to be there before everything is said and done. You saw a lot of the number 15 up front today. Clint Boyer said fell back at the end, but a huge turnaround from struggling most of the week. Congrats to Dale Jr., Steve Letarte. All is right in the racing world, and a lot of people say that all is right in the racing world because Dale Earnhardt Jr. has won once again. Now, we have heard inklings of another run-in between a reporter and Kurt Busch. The story on that is not fully out yet, but the story is out on what happened to Kurt Busch on the racetrack today. Two times we saw Kurt spinning around, and guys, this can't help matters. No, it really can't. This hard left side tire looks like this 51 didn't quite get where it needed to be. He got loose off the exit, and around that 51 went. He got lucky he didn't get collected up and really tore up. You know, I, I mean, I'm not going to criticize. Maybe I'm not half the driver. I just don't understand how he spins out every single week. There's something going on with him. I mean, how do you just spin out? You got to feel it. I mean, I don't care if you're trying or not. This is an under, under, uh, you know, money. This, this team, this car needs to finish. They wreck every week. And they're costing a lot of money and wrecked up race cars. But you know, Kurt Busch is driving as hard as he possibly can to get that car to the front. Now it's time for us to check up, give us a little uh, report card on what we did in performance picks on NASCAR race day this morning. Nobody picked Junior, but look at Matt Clark once again with the top pick. Larry McReynolds had Matt Kenseth. He was third, and somebody else did pretty well in fourth place. But look at Kyle Petty fifth with Jimmy Johnson. I've been so jacked up over Junior. What happened to Mark Martin? I got to find out. I don't That's okay. Know. That's okay. He will not hold it against you because <laughs> oh. you picked him. I can't <laughs> believe that. I left just, Junior on the board. You left him on the board, Kenny. You That's, easily could have done that. That's oh. because I, I love Mark the Kid Martin. He was fast and happy hour, and he was <laughs> sailing along in the top five. Yeah. The whole and he loved, he loved Junior other week. Yeah, you know? absolutely. Uh -huh. I see hey, how you crew are. Chief Chad Canals also had congratulations for Dale Junior as well. It's a whole team effort over there at uh, Hendrick Motorsports. Chad is congratulating everybody, and we'll be back to Victory Lane in just a moment. 
Welcome back, everyone, to NASCAR Victory Lane, fueled by Sunoco. Here is a Dale Jr. fan who is dying for an autograph, but definitely going to be uh, celebrating tonight after Dale Earnhardt Jr.'s big win. Now, it was a great day for Hendrick Motorsports. Not so great a day for Joe Gibbs Racing as all three of their cars had trouble coming off of last week's big win for Joey Logano. Let's take a look at what happened to Joe Gibbs Racing. It's Kyle Busch first for the third week in a row. The number 18 had engine trouble, threw a rod early in the race, and Kyle Busch was behind the wall. Last week's winner, Joey Logano, gets loose, goes into the outside wall. His day was done for all intents and purposes, and he ended a very hot streak of finishes. Now, Denny Hamlin, who has won at this racetrack before, goes into the infield, spins, tears up that race car, but here's where it got scary. As he's coming down pit road, the number 11 car catches on fire, and now it's time for our good Sam roadside assist of the day as the number 16 team, the fire crews, and also a group of army men down there come to the rescue of Denny Hamlin, put out the fire, and fortunately, Denny Hamlin is okay after that pit road incident. So now let's check in with some of the Joe Gibbs drivers. Um, a little frustrating, but um, we had a top 10 car today. I think we had a top 10 coming to us here, maybe even a top five. Um, so we're still on a roll. We still got a, a really good uh, race team, really good cars here. So um, we're not going to let this take us down. We're going to uh, go back out there next week and win that. You, you try to not panic, um, but it's hard for that not to happen when you can start to feel the heat uh, and, and feel the flames. But um, you just try to remain calm and, and realize that you just really got two two buckles you got to undo before you're able to get out. And so, um, you know, for us it was, you know, you don't like to have these things. This is the first time I've ever had it, but it's, it's good to know from this point on if we had that situation, how's the best way to get out. You know, these guys, they had problems today, and we know how solid they've been so far this year, but my biggest concern has to be more the 18 than the wrecks that were involved with Denny Hamlin as well as Joey Logano because that's a part of racing. But these engine problems, this is something that's got to concern Joe Gibbs and J.D. Gibbs because they turned all this stuff over to Toyota, and now they've had some issues and continue to have issues. You'll never win a championship till you can make these cars run and take care of them in you know, a finish races. Yeah, I, I have to agree, Jeff. I mean, Joey Logano, Denny Hamlin, they're on a roll. They're doing good. And actually, the 18 car of, of Kyle Busch is running fairly well. I mean, my gosh, when you blow up three motors in a row, I mean, you can't even judge your team. You can't even say there's anything wrong. You just got to get the motors to last. Got to get the halfway to see what you can do. Absolutely. But right now, Kyle Busch still has control of one of those wild card spots, and he knows how to win races. So he easily could be in chase contention when all is said and done after 26 races. Got to take a quick break here from the Michigan International Speedway. Scene of Dale Earnhardt Jr.'s latest win. We'll be back with much more from Michigan in a moment. NASCAR Victory Lane is driven by Good Sam Roadside Assistance. If it's not Good Sam, it's not good enough. Call or click now. Brought to you in part by Honda Generators, the power of choice. And by Gold Eagle Stable Ethanol Treatment for everyday optimal performance and protection. This July, don't miss the biggest event of the summer as baseball's greatest stars battle for home field advantage in the Fall Classic. The Road to the World Series begins with the 2012 Major League Baseball All-Star Game Tuesday, July 10th at 7.30 p.m. Eastern, 4.30 p.m. Pacific, only on Fox. Well, this weekend started out here at Michigan with blazing speeds and also concern about the tire, and that caused NASCAR to make a mid-weekend audible after Friday. There were speeds were almost 205 miles per hour in practice. Therefore, we saw some blistering. NASCAR and Goodyear decided to ship in a new left side tire, which was a little bit harder, a little bit stronger. They hoped it to bring down the speeds a little bit and also to not blister. So blistering tires were still a challenge for multiple teams because the left side tires didn't blister. But once we got out there, it was the right side tires that blistered along the way. Rochester Hills, Michigan's Brad Keselowski had issues along the way in his blue deuce as he knew something was wrong underneath the race car and said, guys, I got to bring this car into pits. Yeah, I got a nurse this thing. It's getting really loose. Just, just a small vibration. I got to come. I got to come here, man. This ain't right. No such thing as a good vibration out on the racetrack, but Jeff Hammond, you told us earlier today on NASCAR race day, watch out for the blistering of the right side tire. Well, anytime you 
free up basically like the leader left sides where the left sides were the problem so they harden that tire up all of a sudden that puts more work to the right side of the car so if you had a car that was pushing you had a tendency to possibly damage the right front tire but it looks to me like brad's car was a little bit loose he wound up blistering the right rear so again you got to be careful about those kind of things kenny it's up to that driver sometimes to kind of take care of it right chassis setups are so important dale jr didn't have no problems because his car was perfect it's all in the chassis setup all right, we also, every time we uh, do NASCAR Victory Lane here on Speed, we give away the award for the Polaris Hardest Working Pit Crew, and that award goes to Kevin Harvick's number 29 team as they had trouble early in the race. Kevin Harvick made several unscheduled pit stops, but the boys went to work, and they got Kevin Harvick back to a 10th place finish. So congratulations to the number 29 team, the hardest working pit crew on the day. But the biggest story, guys, Dale Jr. has won. No more questions. The drought, the drought is over with. But there's still a lot of questions. It's the one that Kenny asked about the girlfriend. Well, there's that, and also, can he get the championship now? Invest in the stock market tomorrow. Stocks are up. Junior wins. <laughs> All right. Thanks, Just everybody, kidding. for coming along for the ride on this edition of NASCAR Victory Lane, driven by Good Sam Roadside Assistance. Congratulations once again to the number 88 team, and we'll see you down the road on the road course at Sonoma next week. So long. eyes were smiling on Dale Earnhardt Jr. Sunday. You see that monkey fly off his back there. Tonight on NASCAR Race Hub, what did it take to get him back to victory lane? We break down the total team effort. But there were plenty of stories in Michigan. Ambrose goes 203. Marcus Ambrose is here to talk about blistering speeds and proper boomerang technique. Plus, we dissect JGR's worst day in 2012. Absolute shock in the 18 pit. Big fire under the car. With the chase cutoff looming and points tightening, who is safe and who will be sorry? The race hub is jam-packed tonight and it starts right now. Welcome to NASCAR Race Hub, presented tonight by Ram. I'm Danielle Trotta, filling in for Steve Burns tonight. I've only got one half of Double Trouble here with me. Elliot Sadler, so nice to see you, sir. Glad to be here, but I think Trouble will be here later in <laughs> you're the, the show. You're the double. I'm the double part. All right, glad you set the record straight. Matt Clark will be here along with Larry Mack in just a bit to talk Michigan. Elliot, the early buzz, well, tires. Yes. High speeds, rain, but it all gave way at the end of the day when the 88 was in victory lane. Great storyline. Yeah, Dale Earnhardt Jr., Junior Nation is happy. Time for our Ram race highlights to see how Junior got it done in the Irish Hills. How about a few pre-race pounds from the from the crew with the skeleton gloves. I think the skeleton gloves go good with the paint scheme, don't I, you? I did. That fit the Batman theme. Lap 71, the speed Junior was showing as he blows by Marcus Ambrose. He blew by Marcus Ambrose, who, of course, was our pole setter. Then again, going by Tony Stewart here on lap 109. Dale Jr. led more than 90 laps on the day. Showed a lot of uh, a lot of speed in that race car. Yeah, and a great call by Steve Letarte, managing the race all day. Our Castrol move of the race. How about Junior on those restarts? Larry would say on the house side. He's on the house side. He definitely had the track position and the momentum on the outside. We see a restart here on lap 141 with Tony Stewart pushing him out. He did a great job on restarts. He knew clean air out front will give him a great chance to win this race. Snapping a 143 race winless streak, his crew chief, Steve Letard, was experiencing a 115 race winless streak. Here's the emotion they felt as they crossed the checkers. There is going to be a party in Junior Nation tonight. Three by one, hell yeah. <laughs> the streak is over. Dale Earnhardt Jr. back to victory lane in Michigan. Congratulations, Dale Jr. You deserve the button. You did a hell of a job. Thanks. I don't know what to say. You sure we won? Yeah, I double checked. It wasn't the 500. We really won it. It was for real. Here's how Stevie and Dale felt after the race in the media center. That was the worst feeling, riding around there with 15 laps to go, wondering what was going to happen or how you were going to lose. <laughs> so uh, I was just thinking, man, what you know? I, those laps couldn't go by fast enough. I ran. I was like, you know, I got a big lead. I'm taking it. I'm going to take it easy. No, I'm going to run hard, get it over with. You know, so I was in there just going crazy. 
one thing I can say, you know, we've had bad runs, good runs, uh, disagreements, agreements. But I can say from the day we started working together, I don't think – I hope he's never questioned my desire to improve the team and to run well. And uh, I'd never have questioned his desire and, and where he stands as far as the team and what our goals are when we come in here. And I've kept thinking about Steve and the team and how hard we've worked and how we deserve to win and how we should win uh, and was hoping it would happen for everybody. You know, that that was uh, – you know, but that race four years ago was a fuel mileage race, and today we just whooped them really good. Look at the smile on his face. <laughs> Here's where it all started. Michigan 2008, Dale Jr. playing the fuel strategy game, stays out after a late caution. The 88 gets the white flag as the caution comes out for another wreck. So Jr. coasts across the finish line to win his first points race with Hendrick Motorsports. Little did he know it would be four years before Junior would win again. Four years and two days to be exact, Elliot. And look at the numbers two of his other dominant teammates were posting during that time. Tough to believe, but true. It is tough to believe, and it's tough on you as a person. When your teammates are doing a good a job as they're doing with wins and also Jimmy Johnson winning championships, as a driver, you're never guaranteed that next win. So proud of his character and how he reacted and how he did to get himself back to victory lane this weekend. And, Elliot, you can relate as a driver what a, what a winless streak feels like. You won your first cup race in 2001. The next one came in 2004. It's tough, Danielle, and it, because, like I said before, you're not guaranteed everything, anything, and you need to show up at the racetrack each and every week wanting to win, keeping that urge, thinking it's going to happen, keep believing. But you can see the relief in Dale Jr.'s face when he gave that interview, that smile, that we've done it. He doesn't have to answer that question anymore, which can be nagging. I've been there. When? When can you win? And when I talked to him this morning, the biggest thing he said is, Elliot, my fans stood, with, you know, stood by me through thick and thin. Please tell them thank you for their support, and let's all celebrate this together. Yeah, it's a huge moment of validation, I think, for Dale Earnhardt Jr., too. Elliot, Mr. Hendrick likes to say once you win one, they start coming in bunches. What do you think this win can do to Plateau Jr. the rest of the year? Well, they already got a lot of consistency on their team. They've already been a part of this chase format and this chase discussion for a long time. They have more top tens than anybody else in the series right now. They've ran every single lap in 2012. But what does this win do for confidence? I think it does a lot. He's got a lot of good tracks coming up for him in the next month and a half. And like Mr. Hendrick says, now they got that belief. We did this together. Now we can do it again. This is a great day for Junior Nation. Yeah, he's got that confidence, great equipment, right? A great crew chief and a team around him. And he's, what, second in points? Second. In, Mr. <laughs> Hendrick said yesterday, this could be the win that catapults them into contention, a serious contention to win this championship. Junior Nation, no worries. Still plenty more junior talk tonight on the Hub, including we'll also have another guest, a Cup Series first for Marcus Ambrose. Grab that pole. Ambrose goes 203.241. Oh, that's a fast, fast forward right there. Plus, we'll take a look at who might be in trouble with just 11 races left in the race to the chase. Speaking of trouble, from engine failures to crashes to a car in flames, Larry and Elliot discuss how Joe Gibbs Racing moves forward from Sunday. But next, tire trouble on Friday. Called for NASCAR and Goodyear to bring a different rubber for the race. I'll ask the guys what it meant from a crew chief and driver perspective. All that and more coming up. Hub Rolls. NASCAR Race Hub is presented by Ram Trucks. Guts, glory, Ram. Brought to you in part by Pep Boys. Pep Boys does everything for less. Call 1-800-PEP-BOYS. And by Allstate, the only car insurance with a claim satisfaction guarantee. Welcome back. We've got Double Trouble back together. Why does Trouble have to sit by me? <laughs> you knew it was only a matter of time. <laughs> well, there certainly was trouble when it came to tires at Michigan this weekend. Undoubtedly, the real story that began developing on Friday. The guys are going to take it through. Ten drivers broke the 200-mile-per-hour barrier in the first practice, which started Friday morning around 1130. Mark Martin in his MWR Racing Toyota, one of two drivers over 201 miles per hour in that first session the other your eventual race winner dale earnhardt jr nascar's vice president of competition robin pemberton said on thursday that speeds would likely decrease with rubber buildup and rising temperatures in the second practice session on friday afternoon though there were 14 drivers who went over the 200 mark and roush fenway's greg biffle almost hit 
205. So the sensation of those speeds when they continue to build, Elliot. As a driver, can you tell the difference between one, 195 and you cross that 200 mile per hour threshold? <laughs> definitely, definitely very much. And it's not really on the straightaway and going into the corners as much as it is when you're going through the center of the corner. All the G-forces and all the load in the car is trying to push you as a driver to the side of the race car, out of the right side. That's also putting strain and pressure on those tires and doing the same thing, going through the center corner so fast. So definitely a, a big difference on the driver and a big difference as far as the tires are concerned. A lot for crew chiefs to keep up with too, Larry. Well, it, it was, Danielle, but this decision to ma was made on Friday evening to change this left side tire. And, and I talked to Goodyear engineer Rick Campbell, and they gave the crew chiefs and the engineers all this tire data for this new left side tire early Saturday morning, where they were able to walk through a lot of sim programs and work with their engineers. They qualified on the old left side tire, but it was a very long week at Michigan, a very long day on Saturday. Throw in the fact Tony Gibson with Ryan Newman, Chad Canals with Jimmy Johnson, they had engine issues. and. Not only did they change the left side tire on them, those two teams had to change engines for the race on Sunday. Starting in the back of the field, with those high speeds came some trouble with Goodyear's left side tires. About a dozen drivers, including Mark Martin, had their left sides blister during Friday's practice. And late Friday, Goodyear and NASCAR made the call to change to an older left side tire, as Larry said, that was last used at Charlotte in 2006 and 2007. For more on exactly what happens to a tire when it blisters, it's not like the kind on your foot, is it? Let's head next door to Matt Clark in Studio B for a teardown. Thanks, Danielle. Anytime we talk tires and blistering, it's not a good thing. Speeds were high and so were spirits until tire specialists and Goodyear started seeing blistering issues with left side tires. So what causes blistering? Suffice it to say, heat is the root cause. Simply put, the Michigan repave equals a smoother track with more grip and higher speeds. A smoother track also results in little or no tire wear, and that's not a good thing. Tire wear is what allows tires to dissipate the heat. You couple that with the higher ambient temperatures, a darker racing surface, and the conditions were far different from what they were when teams tested in April. So once Goodyear saw what was going on, they had boots on the ground here in the race hub, Charlotte, North Carolina, getting tires loaded for the trip to Michigan. And that was well before any official decision was made. These tires had been kept in a climate-controlled warehouse, and the stock was rotated for quality control. Goodyear had these tires on hand specifically for situations like these. But now NASCAR had other issues. In race conditions, the right side started to show some blisters. And that's simply because the cars were running three to four tenths off of Ryan Newman's old track qualifying record, so speeds were still high. And the new left side tires had less grip, forcing the right side to compensate. But good teams always have a backup plan, and this time it was NASCAR and Goodyear working together to get it right. Back to you, Detroit. Thanks, Matt. There are two notable examples in recent years where tires have been one of the biggest storylines of the weekend. First at Atlanta Motor Speedway in March of 2008, Goodyear had brought a harder tire compound. There were no tire failures during the race, but drivers weren't happy. They were unable to run side by side and only 13 cars finished on the lead lap. Then, of course, the second most notable example. Indianapolis 2008 after Dale Jr., Mark Martin, Carl Edwards, Matt Kenseth and Juan Pablo Montoya each had tire problems early in the race. NASCAR used cautions every 10 to 12 laps and forced teams to change their tires before they failed. After the race, Robin Pemberton assured the public it was a car and tire issue, not a track surface issue, and vowed it would be corrected before the 2009 Brickyard 400. Now, there in, you know, we should expose here that it was the first year for the new car, right, Larry? But also we had Greg Stucker, the representative for Goodyear on NASCAR Performance a few weeks ago, and he said that day at Indianapolis changed the way they prepare for race weekends. Well, and I think that's what led even to this weekend where they had a backup plan in place. Uh, the good news is Akron, Ohio is not that far to Brooklyn, Michigan, and they were able to react. But I think the biggest thing that threw Goodyear a curveball, they have to do a tire test well out from the race where they can decide what tire to build, what tire to run at a particular racetrack. 
racetrack, especially on a repave. When they tested with five teams there in early April, it was in the 60s. And I think everyone anticipated that the speeds were going to go down when we went back in June and we probably would be in the 80s and more rubber. The speeds only got faster when we went back with hotter temperatures and more rubber on the racetrack. Yeah, so Elliot, when they get one extra practice session now on those new tires, drivers got just over an hour to see how it felt. Is that enough time? That's a really good question, and I think it is. I think once a driver gets out there the first couple laps, he can feel what his car is giving him and what he wants, and they make adjustments. What you see NASCAR teams doing now, because a lot of them were up against the wall on how many miles they could run for engine stuff, and Larry hit on it, hit on it earlier, a simulation program that Goodyear gives the teams. See if it works in place with the driver. You make a few laps, see if it works. They had a lot of homework they had to do Saturday night, and you see the best teams figured it out on Sunday. And we go back there in eight weeks, and I found out this morning they're going to go back there they're pretty quickly while the while the weather's still hot there's still rubber on that racetrack and they'll do a tire test probably to tweak the tire combination there when we go back in august i think since the brickyard larry goodyear does not want the tires to be the headlines so they'll do whatever they need to do with backup systems and plan and testing to make sure the headlines are about the drivers and the teams and not the goodyear tires and when we go back to michigan who's going to be the favorite to win that race uh could you say dale Earnhardt <laughs> jr <laughs> you think <laughs> duh the guys are we're going to be back here to talk more about Dale Earnhardt Jr. later in the show. And up next, Marcus Ambrose joins us after his first career pole win in Cup, as well as a top 10 finish at, Miss at Michigan. All that and more coming up next. Richard Petty Motorsports has had some hits and some misses so far in the 2012 season, but one thing they haven't lacked is speed. Each of RPM's drivers have captured a pole, and two weeks ago at Dover, Eric Amarola and Marcus Ambrose both finished in the top 10. Our next guest won the pole for his first Sprint Cup career this past weekend at Michigan and finished ninth for his third top 10 of the season. So good to have a buddy of ours or a mate here on the hub. Marcus Ambrose, thanks for being here. I feel like you're reaching MVP status. <laughs> I am here a lot. It must be for good and bad, right? <laughs> we like it. Qualifying midday on Saturday at Michigan, you grab the pole. Let's take a look. You went pretty fast. We want to talk about those speeds. Of course, Marcus and the number nine Stanley Tools Ford for RPM laying down a lap at 203.241 miles per hour. Good enough for his first Sprint Cup pole in 134 starts. Congratulations. Marcus, we're going to hit you with our Scott trivia question. You're one of four drivers in NASCAR history to win a pole at more than 200 miles per hour. Can you name the other three? Well, Bill Elliott's an easy one. And I'm picking my boss, Richard Petty, and maybe uh, Parsons. Oh, close, very close. Let's take a look at the answer. You got Bill Elliott. Austin Bill from Dawsonville is one. You got Benny Parsons, but it's the Hall of Famer, Kale Yarber. Uh, uh, You're joining some elite company. How cool is that? Well, I'm just a lucky one that got the pole at Michigan because those speeds there for the entire field was exceptionally fast. So a lot of us went over 200 mile an hour that day. I was just the fastest of the 200 mile club, I guess. So I get the records to go with my first pole. Pretty cool. I hope it stands up for a while because, uh, you know, out of racing NASCAR and, and stuff, you want to be remembered for something, right? So right. Being, a, uh, being one of the fastest uh, there was, it was pretty cool. Well, you are the only driver to go over 200 miles an hour grabbing a pole at a track other than Talladega or Daytona. Um, so that's pretty cool. That is awesome too, yeah. <laughs> we're, the, we were talking to a lot of drivers on speed all weekend, wondering what the difference was when you go 195 miles an hour. Then you break that 200 mile per hour threshold, you hit 205. How does it feel? Can you tell a difference? The sensation of speed really doesn't happen until you get into the corner. So the bigger the racetrack, the slower you feel. It's quite often the short tracks that feel the fastest. But once you turn in, you realise how sensitive the car is to any inputs, both throttle, brake and steering, that you realise any, any, any moment you could break loose. And so you just got to hit your marks to inch perfection. You've got to be right on your marks and just commit to the car. The car has to stick at those speeds, you don't have time to correct it. So you just got to trust the car. And uh, I was lucky enough to have a really good balance in my vehicle, had a lot of confidence. My Stanley team had done a great job getting it ready for me and uh, we got the pole.
Yeah, when that green flag waved, you were certainly fast. The first 70 laps, you and Greg Biffle dominating the race. Then one Dale Earnhardt Jr. passes you on lap 70. It seemed like he was the car to beat. As the race progressed, Marcus, how come we couldn't see you get that first <laughs> win on an oval? What happened? Uh, well, a bunch of things really happened. I guess it's, it goes back to the happy hour practice that we had. We were scuffing tyres in, and we didn't quite understand you know, what was happening to that tyre and what we wanted from the tyre. So when we started cycling through different sets of left side tyres, we just started to struggle with the balance, and we lost the handle on the car a little bit. We lost track position. And then we got the car good at the end of the race, but we just ran out of time. So I think we were back to maybe 15th or 16th at one point, and we got ourselves back in the top 10. And we just wanted the race to be another 100 miles. We would have had a chance to get back to the front. But, you know, a great day for Junior. I mean, I was talking to him before the race started about how the pressure was building about getting his win. After four years, you know, you could feel that he, he knew that... You were talking he, to him before the race. Yeah, well, I was listening to Greg Biffle and uh, Junior talk, and we were just chatting about, you know... How, how his car was so good and how he had a chance to win, and he did. And uh, congratulations to him, just a big day. Great to hear the cheer from the crowd when I got out of the car. The crowd was still cheering for Junior on the victory lane there, so pretty cool day. Well, three top tens for you in the past five races, so you're knocking on that door, same as Junior was. The win seems like it's coming, and Sonoma, many fans thinking, could be a good place because you are the road course king. Is the confidence different heading to a Sonoma or a Watkins Glen than it is any other weekend? Yeah, sure. I mean, I'm looking forward to getting to Sonoma, no doubt about it. But the weight of expectation becomes a burden for you. And uh, that track there, I've given away a win once already. I want to really... You know, stand, we weren't going to bring it up, yeah, Marcus. Stand my authority on it, hopefully <laughs> this year. And, and uh, we've got a lot to race for this year. We've got Stanley, have partnered with Ace Hardware and the Children's Miracle Network. Yes. If I, if I win the race, they're going to donate a million dollars. A hundred thousand guarantee, but if I win the race, a million dollars to, to see wonderful. kids in need. So uh, looking forward to it. A lot of pressure, though. And I uh, just <laughs> want to get that monkey off my back for another win. Well, we wish you the best of luck. And... Uh... We brought something you will be familiar with, being from Australia, the old boomerang. We want to toss him in the front yard, if, if you don't mind teaching me. Well, I'm a bad throw, but I can All give right. it a go for you. Coming up, that will be Marcus and I having some fun, so stick around for that. And next on The Hub, Tony Stewart, your defending champion, was the only driver who had the pace to stick with Junior. We'll take a look at his day. Plus, we'll discuss how Joe Gibbs Racing moves on from a third straight engine failure for Kyle Busch. And we'll see how the points and wild card scenarios are shaking out with 11 races to go until chase time. Stay with us. Welcome back to NASCAR Race Hub, presented tonight by Ram. Your defending champion, Tony Stewart, started yesterday in the eighth position on lap 88. He powered his way up to the front, taking the lead on the restart. Tony led 18 laps and was just about the only driver who could keep pace with Dale Earnhardt Jr. Lap 109, Stewart would be no match for the 88. You can see him pull over. For Dale Jr. From there, Dale would cushion that lead, giving himself almost a six second advantage over Smoke. Stewart would go on to finish second and grab his sixth top five finish of the season. Dale had to pass this car all day. I mean, he, he could run the same pace pretty much the whole run, and we could do it for about the first half of the run, and then we'd lose pace. You know your uh, thoughts about Dale? Right. No different than anybody else that does it. I mean, it's not it's not a national holiday guys i mean you know this morning they were celebrating his fourth anniversary of his last win and so i guess we're all in a state of mourning now because he's broke that string now so i don't know what we're all supposed to think you gotta love tony stewart <laughs> here are your top 10 michigan finishers 19th career win for dale jr fifth straight Top 10 for Smoke at Michigan. Jimmy Johnson changed his engine, started at the back, still finished fifth. Jeff Gordon just got his fourth top 10 of the season. Eighth place is Juan Pablo Montoya, best finish for him in 2012. Let's hear from the rest of your top five. You know, we had a good race car, just the setup wasn't very good. And uh, Jimmy and Nick and, and Boogie and them guys, um, you know, worked on it hard overnight in the whole engineering department. And guy gave me something I could drive today. So we took off, and, and it wasn't that, that bad. It was never exactly like we wanted to, but it was uh, pretty competitive. 
I had to take care of the right rear. I kept blistering the right rears. So uh, I just had to drive it easy there at the end. Top five is, is uh, you know, a good thing. And with the issues we've had, we had today, starting in the back, blistered a couple right rear tires, um, ran out of fuel coming to the checkered, <laughs> pit sequence issues, pit stops. Yeah, it was, it was a long, long day. But uh, I'm very proud of, uh, you know, the, the effort that we put in to rebound and get back and get a top five. In the standings now, we're looking at points ahead of 10th place. Jimmy picked up one spot after Michigan and is now fourth. Dale Jr. just four points back of your leader, Matt Kenseth. Kevin Harvick still hanging around in sixth. Quiet 12th place finish yesterday for Martin Truex Jr., who's seventh. Brad Keselowski rounds out the top 10. Larry and Elliot are back with us. Going back to the top 10 from Michigan, who of those drivers stands out to you? Well, to me, it's Juan Pablo Montoya, a guy that really hasn't run that great this year on big tracks. His best finish of the season of eighth. Oh, yeah, just in time before they go to a road course at Sonoma, which he won to one at a couple years ago. And then the driver that jumps out at me, Clint Boyer, in that 15 team, they qualified 13th. But where I was a little confused is on lap 166 after a full fuel run, Brian Paddy decided, even with having to dump a full load of fuel to get to the end of the race. They changed no tires, and for the first 10 or 15 laps, Clint Boyer was sideways with old tires and a full load of fuel. Finally, things leveled out. The good news is he finished seventh, which is his third consecutive top 10 finish, and he's sitting well inside the top 10, ninth in points. Well, guys, a team that stood out, but not for a good reason, was Joe Gibbs Racing. On lap 86, Kyle Busch, for the third week in a row with problems, goes to the garage with engine issues. Lap 126 on the back stretch. Your winner from last week at Pocono, Joey Logano, gets loose in traffic. There's a big wreck here involving Casey Kane, who really had nowhere to go, runs right into the 38 of David Gilliland. That would end Logano's day. Lap 133 on the restart. Say it ain't so for Denny Hamlin on the inside of Martin Truex Jr. with Ryan Newman. On the outside, gets loose, coming off four, has contact with the 39, goes into the grass. We go on board now with Newman for a second look at this contact between the two. And now the result. It's our Ram Guts and Glory moment. Denny Hamlin on fire for the first time in his career. Coming down pit road, wants to get out of that car quick. You see the fire extinguishers in there. That means not a lot of oxygen. Luckily, he gets out safely. Was running 14th at the time of the incident. Guys, here are the positions 11 through 20 in the points with the difference back from 10th. And you see those little carrots on the left-hand side of your screen. Kyle Busch and Ryan Newman right now, your two wild card spots. Who's in this group most that needs to work to get to the chase? Well, me, I'm going to start with Carl Edwards. I know he's 11th in points, only two points from 10th, but he's 25 points behind Boyer. Keselowski is 10th with two wins. Everybody around him has wins. The 99 car has got to be getting worried and got to know how to run a little bit better like their teammates, Greg Biffle and Matt Kenseth, to make the chase. And then I look at Casey Kane back there, 16th in the points. He has that win at Charlotte. Started the season off just terrible, almost fell out of the top 35, and then had seven consecutive top 10s, but blew the right front and hit the wall at Pocono last week. And he was also caught up in that wreck with Joey Logano on that restart. So a couple of bad races for Casey Kane. And you can see that number's growing as far as how many points out of 10th that he is. He is in the hunt, though, still with that one win, though, Larry. That, that will help the, the cause. <laughs> Guys, Kyle Busch has currently that wild card spot. But tonight's Pep Boys question of the week has to do with JGR Driver. It comes from Billy in Baton Rouge, Louisiana. He asked, do you think the recent engine failures at Joe Gibbs Racing are more about the driver since each time it's been happening to Rowdy. Well, I don't think we can blame it on Kyle Busch because even though they've had three consecutive engine failures, it's been three different issues. At Dover, it was valve springs. It, it was from the car being loose and turning a lot of RPM up off the corner. At Pocono, as Dave Rogers, his crew chief, told me, it was pretty much self-inflicted with the oiling system in the top side of the engine. Yesterday, I think, definitely has them scratching their head because that was a broken rocker arm. But, Elliot, one thing that didn't get noted yesterday, Mark Martin, who runs a TRD engine, had engine issues with six laps to go in that race. This is one thing why I love Twitter. I saw this morning Kyle Busch actually tweeted to remind fans it was not Joe Gibbs Racing Engine Shop. It was TRD, which is telling me 
Cal might be getting to the end of his rope. He wants this stuff rectified right now. Tells me the wires are starting to spark <laughs> just a little bit. I don't blame him. Yeah, yeah, it's tough to have quality control when your engines aren't in-house. We still have plenty more to come on the Hub. Tony Stewart says it's not a national holiday, but we're talking Dale Jr. coming up soon. We recap Dale's weekend at Michigan and take a look back at the times he's come oh so close to winning. And Jr.'s victory dominated the Twitter world after the race. Monica Palumbo shows you the best of the best. And next, Marcus Ambrose in an Australian pastime of throwing a boomerang. He'll try to teach me how to do it. You don't want to miss it. Stay with us. Welcome back to NASCAR Race Hub. Not a bad way to spend a Monday. Just hanging out in the yard with a good mate, Marcus Ambrose. Did you like the Aussie accent? Good night, no, mate. Well, it was a good try. <laughs> Well, speaking of try, you're going to teach me how to throw a boomerang. And I hear there's a lot of skill involved. I'm a bit nervous. Well, we're going to try, but these are somewhat ornamental boomerangs. They're not the real deal. Not ridgy digi as I'd say in Australia. Ridgy digi Yeah. In a perfect world, you did, your uh, boomerang's going to come back. But um, I don't think it's going to work this time. All right, let's give it a try. Think positive, Marcus. Righto. So you want it dead upright. And you want to have the round piece facing you. So you're going to have that like that. Okay. All right, and you're going to throw it basically straight and try to get it, keep it low to the ground because it's going to spin up in the air. Maybe a slight kick, maybe yep. 20 degrees okay. off. Yeah. You got a bit on it. When's the last time you threw one of these? Well, I've never thrown one very well. <laughs> so there are people that actually, there is a sport of boomerang towing. They yeah, actually yeah, have competitions. Oh yeah, they can do the whole thing. Oh. I think some of the communities out in the uh, Australian outback still use you know, traditional methods to uh, to get their meals. So. In the outback. Yeah, in the outback. Yeah. I that's love not it. the outback steakhouse. Right. That's that's a genuine outback. <laughs> there you get a boomerang. You don't get a blooming onion. You don't get a blooming <laughs> onion. You get you get a burnt suntan and uh, a lot of blowflies. <laughs> All right, let me see what you got. Okay, so I'm not too confident, but we'll have a shot at it. There it goes. Oh, yeah. If there was a bird in that tree, it would have been dinner. It's like golf. So much to think about. So the Aborigines used these to hit animals, but if they missed, they wanted to come back so they didn't have to run and get it because obviously they've got to keep chasing the animals, right? So when you swing, don't aim high, aim low. Aim low. Yeah, because the animal's going to be oh, obviously yeah. low to the ground, right? I want to hit that kangaroo. You, you look like dangerous here. I'm going to stand okay, back. Okay, step now. back. Uh, I think that kangaroo is still bouncing. <laughs> I don't want to hit it. There you go. Yes! I almost got you it. You got it. <laughs> All right, your turn. Show me how it's done. Beauty. That was nice. But it's meant to come back. Still to come on the hub, plenty more of NASCAR's most popular driver. Four years and 143 races later, the 88 was in victory lane. We'll recap his weekend and also take a look back at a few races where Junior fell just short of that elusive win. Keep it here. Welcome back to NASCAR Race Hub, presented tonight by Ram. It's fitting that Dale Earnhardt Jr. won for the first time in four years on Father's Day. The Intimidator's fiercely loyal fan base morphed into Junior Nation once Dale Earnhardt Sr. passed away in 2001. After yesterday's win at Michigan, Jr. thanked his fans for never wavering throughout the highs and lows of his cup career. Here's Dale Jr.'s winning weekend recap. In sports, there are good streaks and there are bad streaks. In 2008 at Michigan, One Nation was looking to end a bad one. With 76 races without a win, a question of fuel was all that stood in Dale Earnhardt Jr.'s way. He wants to know if he should run hard, Tony. Step forward. Step forward. You, know, you just don't want to say, do you? It's going to be close. I promise you. I don't know what your, I don't know what your game fuel deal is, how much you've been saving, but it's racing. If we lose, we lose. If we win, we're going to win it. One attempt at a green-white checkered finish. This will be the last lap of the race. White flag at Michigan. Caution is out. The race is over. Yeah, baby. <laughs> 76 races.
Texas. Dale Earnhardt Jr. is the winner. Way to go, Dale Jr. Good job. Woo! But as this prodigy celebrated in Victory Lane, no one knew another streak would be born in the Irish Hills. With a new winless streak at 104 in Charlotte, Earnhardt was in position to beat the odds again in 2011. But that same question of fuel haunted him. Dale Earnhardt Jr. is slowing. He is going to run out of gas. Yeah, we had it. Just a little bit more gas, man. Heartbreak for Junior Nation. A new dawn has risen for the 88 in 2012, and this dark night wants to prove it again at Michigan. At 200.80 miles per hour, been fast all weekend. My car ain't as good as I want it to be, but I can't practice anymore, so this ain't, this ain't cool. <laughs> Dale Jr. has been one of the fastest cars all weekend. Not good right there. The back end moved out just a little bit, hurt his speed. I feel like we're getting real close. If we keep going, we're, we're going to win some races. We just got to keep working. Back in Michigan, Dale Hart Jr. just hit pit road. No, just too much. Yeah, it's Dwayne The right side tires going out, and they are good to go. At this juncture, even on a green and white checker finish, Dale Earnhardt Jr. back in the race lead with 27 laps to go. Doing great, bud. 8-4. They are going crazy in Michigan. There you go, buddy. White flag. Finally, all will be right in the world. Dale Earnhardt Jr. winning today in Michigan. Hell yeah. <laughs> I know you guys have been waiting on that one. I know I have. Dale Jr.'s great start to the 2012 season continues. Since Fontana in late March, he's finished every race in the top 10 except for Darlington. He finished 17th there. He's also been in the top five in points for the entire season and now sits second behind your leader, Matt Kenseth. Now for some... More recent near wins for Junior. Close, but no cigar, right? Just months after his 2008 win at Richmond, Junior led 90 laps before contending with Kyle Busch for the lead and then pushes him out of the way. Many thought this was payback for Kyle's bump on Junior the previous May. Junior finished fourth. Next, the Daytona 500, February in 2010. Junior passed nine cars in the final two laps during the green-white checkered finish. He needed to pass ten. Junior finished second behind Jamie McMurray. He had another shot at the win at Martinsville in 2011. He was leading with four laps to go when Harvick was able to pass him. Earnhardt refused to give Har Harvick the chrome horn to win. People wondering, does Junior have the will to win? Does he want it? Everybody's a psychologist when it comes to Junior. Last weekend at Pocono, Earnhardt had the best car in the field, but it was not yet his time. With 21 laps to go, Earnhardt pitted just in case he didn't have enough fuel and had to start from the middle of the pack on the restart and ended up finishing eighth. For more reaction to Dale Earnhardt Jr., we are celebrating that win today. <laughs> Matt Clark joining Larry McReynolds and Elliot Sadler. Larry says it feels like what? At the Triple death? trouble. Well, the, the, <laughs> no, I think the it's last double supper. trouble. <laughs> last supper, and I'm on the bubble. Yeah. Double trouble, and I'm on the bubble. I like that. Bring in your A game. Steve Letard certainly brought his yesterday. Dale Earnhardt Jr.'s crew chief. I'll pose this question to the crew chief of the panel, Larry Mack. You saw Stevie's eyes were filled with tears after that win, and you can only wonder the emotion he was feeling coming so close so many times, and the pressure weighing in on him. Well, yeah, it had been 115 races since Steve Letard had been to victory lane and I related a little bit to the two years that I spent with Dale Earnhardt Sr. and I feel like Steve Letard has went through the same thing. If you win it's because you've got a great race car driver, rightly so, but if you lose it's because as a crew chief you have no idea what you're doing but when that race started guys remember he qualified 17th in six laps of racing up to that second caution he dropped like a rock. Steve Letard brought him to pit road when most everyone else stayed out they made a major swing with a chassis change, put a left rear spring rubber because he was so loose he couldn't even think about touching the throttle, restarted 27th, and that was a change that brought that race car and Dale Earnhardt Jr. to life. And when drivers win typically every Monday, we sit here and talk about momentum and confidence. When Dale Earnhardt Jr. wins, the scope becomes a little broader. What can this do for the sport? Elliot, you brought some props here. Just how big <laughs> is a win when Dale Earnhardt Jr. gets it? Well, anytime the biggest name in a sport has a good day and goes to victory lane, it's big for everybody as a whole. It's big for all the drivers and all the sponsors. And just a few uh, papers here. We got like the U.S. Sports uh, USA Today. He's on the front page of that. The Charlotte Observer. 
<laughs> big part of that. What I'm saying, it's big when the biggest name does well. Yeah. Not only is he a good guy, he's a good person, but when the best driver and the best name does so good for the sport, that's why you see so many other drivers happy for somebody like Dale Earnhardt Jr. Well, I think what it does is put the spotlight on a driver that's popular to, you know, the guy at home that maybe doesn't follow our sport every single week and go, Huh, what's going on in NASCAR? Dale Earnhardt Jr. is winning. It's good for everybody on a grand scale. What does it say for the team, the 88 team, working side-by-side -side with the 48 every day inside Hendrick Motorsports? Jimmy's rattling off wins. Jr. doesn't get one in four years. It, it's been uh, a long time in the making, but I will tell you this. At the team level, having talked to a number of the team guys, you know this has been building. You have to be in position to win it. You just don't run 20th, 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 then you win. Win. These guys actually have been working together well in a long time to get them to a place. That combination, that crew chief driver combination between Stevie and Dale is unbelievable. And, and Mr. H will tell you, he gets the credit for kind of bringing Dale in and getting him settled and making him feel and making him believe in himself. Elliot, how important is it for a driver to have your crew chief believe in you? Well, it's 100% important, especially with your team behind you. I heard Steve Latart say this morning on the radio, he was so happy for his guys in the shop. He could go around and look them all face to face in the eye. You're winners now. We won together and we can move on from this. That's a big lift in momentum on their side. I'm sure the 88 had quite the celebration last night after the win. We were <laughs> not invited. Tiny. I'm a little sad about that. Monica Palumbo and I are throwing our own Dale Earnhardt Jr. party coming up after the break and we're going to play dress up too. I know you're going to want to stick around from that. We'll have reaction from the social garage next on NASCAR Race Up. Stay with us. Junior Nation and everyone else that is a proud card carrying member of Junior Nation today. Welcome to the social garage, Dale Junior style. Monica Palumbo is here and looking gorgeous. Uh, so are you and we are just jacked up on Mountain Dew. Woo! Baby, do the do. We are Junior Fied today. That's right. We got a Diet Mountain Dew. Yes. We got the monkey off Junior's back. So <laughs> we're ready to roll to Twitter world because we've got a lot to cover. First up in what's trending is that Junior was trending literally both hashtag Dale Jr. and hashtag Junior Nation trended after his big win. So do you think that he'll get on Twitter now? Mm, I don't think so. No, he's a pretty private guy, don't you think? Oh, yes. But though his sister probably will yeah. for him. And she did. Speaking of Kelly, she tweeted, finally, the thrill of victory. Definitely a time to celebrate for Junior Nation and the whole family. A few other big names in sports chimed in on the big win. Dick Vitale said, Junior rolls on Father's Day. Start those engines, baby. No, he said, Junior won, baby. That was awesome, baby. Duke, I mean, Dale Junior. It sounded better in my head. <laughs> no, I and racing legend Mario Andretti tweeted that it was great to see Dale Jr. in victory lane again. And now on to a little segment I like to call, Who's That Girl? Amy Ryman, Jr.'s girlfriend, was there in victory lane and Twitterverse exploded. Nikki Monson said, so glad Jr. won so we could finally <laughs> meet his girlfriend. Jeez, Twitter is buzzing more about her than the actual win. Her name is Amy and she is beautiful. Yeah, she's a looker. You need to bring her out more, Dale. <laughs> a fan told Brad Keselowski he needed to find out if Amy has a single sister. And BK said, been there, done that, and she's <laughs> married. That's great. You can't blame a guy for trying. Exactly. So, okay, we saw Junior on the phone with Rick Kendrick before he climbed into victory lane, but Mr. H was still able to make a guest appearance in the media center and how do you manage that oh there he is mr <laughs> hendrick the bobblehead even nascar has a sense of humor yeah. when dale earnhardt jr wins he was just right in the world missed the thing did he <laughs> and finally since it was father's day after all so here's our all moment of the week mike davis who works for junior motorsports had this little girl named lillian ann at 303 a.m yesterday morning and he was so excited for the bosses when he tweeted that he may have to consider a birth certificate change to Michigan. Congrats to you, Mike. Oh, we sweet. have so much fun. I hope Junior wins more often. I don't want to wait four years to do this. Me either. I was liking doing the do. I like the monkey and the do. <laughs> Thanks, Monica. We'll cap the hub right after this. NASCAR Race Hub is presented by Ram Trucks. Guts, glory, Ram. Brought to you in part by Ortho Weed Be Gone Max Lawn Weed Killer. Defend what's yours. And by Castrol Edge with Syntec Power Technology.
Tomorrow on The Hub, of course, we'll have more on Dale Jr.'s monumental victory. We'll talk with Hub MVP Greg Biffle. Also, part one of Steve Burns' all-access conversation with Bill Elliott. Plus, analysis from Jeff Hammond and the one and only Jimmy Spencer. That's all for tonight. Steve Burns will be back with you tomorrow. Thanks to Marcus Ambrose for joining us. And yes, I know the joke. A boomerang that doesn't come back is called what? A stick. Thanks for sending it to me on Twitter, Bill, everybody. Junior Nation, hope you had a good time celebrating and hubbing it out with us. We'll see you tomorrow night at 6 p.m. Eastern on Speed.